Hello, do you like New Japan Pro Wrestling? Are you a Shin Nihon freak? If so, check out the Super Jcast with Joel and Damon on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And even if you fucking hate New Japan Pro Wrestling, listen to the Super Jcast anyway. Not just for our great show reviews, analysis, and pastrami sandwiches, mm -hmm. but there's also usually some dick jokes somewhere in the obligatory opening 30 minutes of absolute nonsense we chat about every single week. That's the Super Jcast for all all the best talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling, crisps, and pornography. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Thank Hello. Zoom lady. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was too busy thanking the Zoom lady. <laughs> Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I think this was the first episode where you did not hear my voice first, um, if, if, if the recording did, in fact, catch that. Um, but joining me today, uh, returning to the show, it's coming to us from Ireland. It's Garrett Kidney. Garrett, how are you doing today? This is why you can't invite me on the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I'm too much of a scoundrel. <laughs> I'm interrupting intros. I'm thanking Zoom ladies for saying recording has started. I can't be trusted. Yeah, is that is that a first time joke you've ever made? Is when the Zoom lady says recording has started and you say thank you, Zoom lady, or have you made that joke many times? Because it feels like you probably have made it many times. Yeah, Lord, no, I'm a hack. I have no original content. It's just regurgitating the same four lines over and over again. Yeah, but I've never heard it before, so I thought it was kind of funny. Um, ah, you see, once once you play to a different room every time, all your material is original. So, yeah, originality is uh is overrated. That was one of the uh, that was one of the bad thing or one of the many bad things about the invention of Twitter was that like if a joke was really good, it would get put out there online really quickly and everyone would see it. So you could no longer impress as many people with it if you saw like a funny thing online. Um, but uh, I think that's probably Twitter's biggest uh, negative contribution to society is, is is not allowing us to regurgitate the same jokes over and over again. I don't know. If you spend long enough on Twitter, you've seen the same four jokes every three months and every time they have 50,000 likes. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is fair. Um, but anyway, uh, Garrett's on the show today uh, because I wanted to talk about a very specific topic, and that is the career of Samoa Joe. And I have been able to actually do a lot of research to this for this pod and I was able to watch a lot of stuff for this pod. And many of you would say, ask, well, Jesse, don't you normally do that for every pod? And the answer is probably not. Um, but for whatever reason, I had a lot of time to think about this one. So I was able to watch a lot of Samoa Joe matches <laughs> before um, this podcast. But the, the reason I wanted to talk about Samoa Joe was my, my premise is essentially that I think that Samoa Joe from a skills perspective is basically the like has like checks pretty much every box you would want for a main event wrestler he uh can promo he has aura he is a convincing in-ring wrestler he can have good matches he um projects a element of danger and menace in both his promos and his in-ring work uh and the fact that he has spent basically the last 20 years kind of going up and down and never really finding a true level of consistency in terms of being a main event talent um in a major company i think that fact is one of the biggest indictments of the shortcomings of wrestling creative over the last 20 years and the fact that we're now really um, for one of the only few times now seeing Samoa Joe as like a world champion in a major company uh, for an extended period of time. And it's it's happening in 2024 when he's been great for over 20 years now. Um, is, 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 is I'm thankful that we're getting to see it. Um, I think he's doing a great job as a W world champion, but I'm also kind of puts in perspective like how is this man who should be super super easy to book as a top guy had such an inconsistent career in that realm and 
maybe you could say part of it is his fault, but it seems like most of it is just down to he was never in, he was rarely in a company that kind of wanted to put him in this role. And I'll turn it over to you, Garrett. Kind of what are your immediate thoughts when I think, when I say Samoa Joe? What kind of wrestler do you think of when you think about him? The thing with Joe for me always is believability. Like you watch that man at any point in his career and you look in his eyes, no matter what he's saying, and he can be saying some like WWE bullshit or some real good like blood feud stuff. But you look in that man's eyes and you believe what he's saying. You know, there, there is no pretense to it. There is no like a wink and a nudge and a smile to it. There is no meta aspect to it. There is no I'm pulling back the curtain and showing you a bit of the fourth wall. Every time Samoa Joe goes out there and performs, you believe him. Like every aspect of him as a performer, from his physicality to his presence, to his aura, to how he carries himself, to how he talks, to how he acts. Like every aspect of him is believable, which stands in such stark contrast to, I think a lot of people today, we're, we live in a very ironic era in general, where it's not just wrestling that has descended into like a, a, like a plague of irony. I think a lot of media has, as, as we were in a, a meta era where everyone has to show you how self-aware they are at all times. And then someone like Samoa Joe, especially now, stands out in that crowd because Joe just doesn't do that. Joe is just it's Samoa Joe. You believe him because the, the one Samoa Joe clip from WWE that does the rounds every single time is that one where he's calling out all the people in the ring on SmackDown. And the reason that does the rounds, as we were talking about every three months on Twitter, is because Joe is believable. I mean, Joe comes out there and tears those, like Jeff Hardy and a couple other people who are out there, tears them to shreds, and everyone posts that clip every few months because Joe rocks. Because when Joe says something, you believe it. And that I think that is like one of the most valuable skills you can have in wrestling because that's what brings the audience in. More than anything else, believability is what brings the audience in because you want to suspend your disbelief about these characters and these moments and these stories and these matches. And Joe could make you do that in practically any context, which is really impressive to do that. Like, it's one thing to do that when he's wrestling AJ Styles and he's having these really physical matches, but he can do that for like the goofy, silly wrestling stuff too, which a lot of people can't. Yeah, and it seems so. This everything about Samoa Joe seems so simple, yet is also seems so rare in pro wrestling today. Which is like you said, oh, he's really believable, and his character is largely this, you know, very serious, tough guy, which we think should not be a particularly rare character for somebody to embody in pro wrestling. Yet it is, um, and a lot of it is kind of the era that he's in and that we've been in for a long time in terms of what people expect when it comes to a top wrestling star but he serves often as a contrast to things that we've seen like he's you know he beat mjf for the world title he's been the world champion over the last few months as mjf has been off of AEW programming and you really couldn't pick someone who's been any different than the mjf run in terms of like you said um he's not ironic He's not serving really for any comedic purpose and everything about him from his in-ring persona to his style as a wrestler, to his promos, to, to even his name is such a basic like meat and potatoes wrestler. And it is, I think, a really refreshing part of AEW that I think a lot of people were missing when MJF was the top guy and the most featured act of the company. Um, and again, that kind of serves to it's it's not just a contrast to MJF, but it is a contrast to like a lot of other top wrestlers today, like Seth Rollins, to give another example. Samoa Joe is a completely different persona than Seth Rollins and, in my opinion, a needed persona than a lot of what we see today. Yeah, because and you, you can extend it not just to MJF, like the, the entirety of 2023 AEW was mixed to say the least um and then like if you wanted to do a reset if you wanted to restore the feeling if you will if you wanted to go back to like pro wrestling 101 basics that work there's nobody better than Samoa Joe to do that to, just like to, to reset as a believable world champion who will carry that belt in the way a world champion should and lose it in a way that world champion should like Samoa Joe is not the performer in 20 20- 
2024 that he was in 2005. He is far from it. He does need, like, not that he's bad or anything, but uh, the old Kevin Nash statement uh, rings true in my mind. You know, you need to create some movement for Samoa Joe these days, um, which is funny because his entire TNA thing was that he was like a Kevin Nash disciple. So so now he's he's like living some of the Kevin Nash principles, which is the reason like the Darby Allen matches work so well again with Samoa Joe because Darby is a guy who can create a ton of movement for Joe and make him look like a, a badass monster. But like even given those limitations, he's still the perfect world champion for AEW in this moment when they want to kind of reset the tone of the company back to something that is more serious grounded pro wrestling. And for AEW, kind of unexpected. Like I did not expect at the start of 2023 that like Samoa Joe would win the world title. Because if you look at the AEW roster, you would think, okay, they right now, especially it's like, they've got some, some other guys that they want to have, run with the world title they probably want to crown some guys on the roster a wrestler who's been a, around for 20 plus years that um is is over the age of 40 you wouldn't necessarily say like okay that guy is, is a good world champion for us right now but he's stepped in um when they either needed to or wanted to take the title off of mjf and He's been, like you said, the perfect kind of champion. I don't want to say he's a transitional champion because that usually just means they only have the title for like one defense. But he has been perfect for kind of transitioning into this new era. And I'm really happy that he's getting a legitimate run with the world title. Uh, I, I had the good fortune of I was at Big Business on Wednesday and I was able to see the Wardlow match. And I was like, I'm so happy for Samoa Joe not only to have this world title run, but he, you know, he's getting a T, uh, you know, a, a, a TV defense where he wins cleanly um, against at least a semi-protected opponent. And I was like, I'm happy that he didn't just have the title for a month, that he's probably going to hold on to it for at least a little bit longer. Um, and it really serves as kind of um, a, a needed achievement when I kind of thought those days were over for Samoa Joe, the days of him being a world champion were over. Um, and it's really refreshing to see him with that title, both as a fan of him, but also because the quality of his work and kind of the necessity of hitting that reset for AEW. And like, it wasn't unfounded that a lot of people thought that Joe just wasn't at that level anymore. Like, like Joe has been around NXT and, and uh, Indies post TNA for the last decade. And as like he he wasn't the same Samoa Joe like like there there's no like papering over that he he wasn't the guy that people fell in love with entirely, so when when he like when he had that NXT title reign like personally for me I was like you know it, it kind of makes me not sad but like it 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 just it it's not the same Samoa Joe so I watch it and I'm like oh <laughs> you know but. The, the AEW did such a good job of like the thing Joe has above all else is aura. Like he just has that presence. So if you protect that above all else, there's so much more you can do with Samoa Joe uh, as a as a wrestler. So you have to be really smart about how you use him and use him to his strengths these days. And I think particularly last year, like when he started into those derby matches and then went into the punk stuff, like uh, Joe had that world, like his, his world title run in the last year was entirely based on merit. Like, I don't get the sense that like Joe winning the belt was the plan for the whole year of 2023 AEW, as opposed to obviously circumstances in the year of 2023, a bit of a wild year for AEW, uh, but circumstances pushing him to the point where they were looking around that company at the end of 2023 being like who's the right guy for this moment and they look at the people they've had that year and like arguably the best answers for that year were christian and samoa joe <laughs> and christian was off doing his own thing and joe fresh off the punk matches fresh off the derby stuff looking like as good as he has looked in literally 15 years he was the right guy for the right moment so it, it, it is interesting to see how, how, how like he has actually had that little redemption arc of uh, a guy who wasn't delivering on the level people would have expected of a Samoa Joe for a, a little while and started doing that again. And uh, I think that made a lot of people happy to get that feeling from Samoa Joe again, when I don't think a lot of people expected to. Yeah, when you think about it, he has been gone from TNA for like a really long time. Nearly 10 years. Yeah. 2015 he left. And those last few years in TNA, he was... There was, for a variety of reasons, was not necessarily the same Samoa Joe. Um, so even though he's been around for a while, 
because he's kind of bounced around a few different promotions, you know, he's on NXT, then he was on the main roster. He did some ROH dates um, in between that. He, um, he hasn't necessarily been overexposed to the, to the degree, you know, he's been on, on major American television for pretty much 20 years now um, in one way or another. But because of, I think a lot of like the, the inconsistencies with his, with how he's been booked, he doesn't feel nearly as as exposed um, to the audience as, as someone as, as pretty much anyone else has had that amount of experience uh, working on television in the U.S. And um, so he does kind of feel refreshing to a degree. Um, and there's also a hint of like for me, there's a hint of nostalgia where I'm just like, you know, what? I'm really happy that Samoa Joe is getting this opportunity because I really do feel like he his career has never been he has never been pushed probably as hard consistently as he has deserved to and again i think that's an indictment on people having a very narrow view on who could be a, a top wrestler um because like in tna there were definitely times where he was pushed as a top guy but at the same time even at his peak in tna i still always got the impression that that company was always looking for like, okay, right, who's someone else that fits the mold of top star better than Samoa Joe? Who is someone from WWE that we can bring in and sign? Who is someone that, you know, has that, that big physique that we can push behind? How, how do you, how would you kind of summarize Samoa Joe's kind of time in TNA and kind of the ups and downs of how he was perceived through various leadership changes um, during his career there? The amazing thing to me is that if you were to take bets in June 2005, when Samoa Joe debuted in TNA, about whether or not TNA would do a good job booking Samoa Joe, everyone in the world probably would have said no. Like, based on the three years track record you had of TNA at that point, would you have been like, they're going to do a good job of that? They're going to do right by Samoa Joe? I think a lot of people would have said no. And it, like, it was almost shocking just how well they did with Samoa Joe for 18 months. Like, mm -hmm. like Joe came in and he was booked exactly like you should book Samoa Joe. Like, even if you had concerns about Joe coming from Ring of Honor, doing these long, big, epic matches, coming to TNA to do these, like, shorter, explosive TV-style matches, which was the house style of TNA at the time. Like, they just still had an AJ going out there on pay-per-view and having those long matches. But obviously, uh, on TV, on a one-hour impact... You're not getting that kind of time. So like you had Joe coming into this new environment, having to transition to TV wrestling. And you'd be like, what were they going to do? Do a good job? Like, I, I don't think many would have thought they would have. And like, they really did. Like, the, the, it was probably like, it's still probably like the best booked Samoa Joe has ever been on TV. Like for that, that 18 month stretch where he started running through the X division, had great pay-per-view matches against Sanjay and Chris Saban, went into the Styles Daniels, Joe stuff. Then they started elevating him into world title stuff. He had the pay-per-view match with Scott Steiner where he beat Scott Steiner on pay-per-view. Like the, the way you're supposed to use a Scott Steiner if you have a Scott Steiner is to elevate a Samoa Joe. And they actually did that. And then, as you said, like Kurt Angle came in and skipped the line. Like, like I always insist, like Joe beating Jared at Bound for Glory in 2006 should have been that main event as opposed to Sting. And then Kurt Angle comes in and beats Joe. And Joe has to spend another basically 18 months or so after that to get to the world title. And like, you know, Joe beating Angle in 2008 is a moment in its own right. But like the, the difference between June 2005 to like, November 2006 in terms of how Joe is booked and the difference between November 2006 and when he wins the world title in April 2008 with how Joe is booked is completely night and day. And you might argue, what's the difference there? It might be a man named Vince Russo, but uh, like his TNA run couldn't have started better, like in terms of they realized what they had and presented him as, at the very least, the number two star in the company very, very, very quickly behind either like Christian or Jarrett, depending who was the world champion at the time. And then Russo came in and Angle came in and everyone skipped in front of him. And Russo didn't get him very, very clearly. And that was the problem with Samoa Joe's career, right? You go back to like WWE at the time. The reason he went to TNA in 2005 as opposed to WWE is fears that like WWE at, in that moment in time were not hiring Samoa Joe's. You know, they looked 
that a guy like Smojo, both the style he worked and his physique, and they were like, nope, that's not for us. And like they had no successful indie wrestlers at that point. Like there, there was no case study for any wrestler coming from the indies or having like a quote unquote internet reputation and going to WWE and succeeding. Like you would have like Paul London and Brian Kendrick as a kind of micro case as a tag team and then eventually CM Punk as a top guy after that. But at that point, there was none. So Joe was looking at that and being like, I'll take my bets with TNA. And it did work out for a while, but then it didn't work out for even longer. Yeah, I mean, those first 18 months for him in TNA, one of the, when you kind of go back and, and, and read about that and you watch some of those matches, the odd thing, and again, this is kind of where I think his, the, his shortcomings in TNA are from a creative end are he has his 18th month winning streak where he's like presented as this dominant guy, but he never wins the world title. And so it's like, he, yes, he's protected and yes, he's kind of being presented as a top guy, but at the end of the day, it's still, you know, Jeff Jarrett and Sting in the world title picture. It's not for Samoa Joe. He's in the X division and he's, you know, wrestling other guys. He's even beating Jeff Jarrett. Um, in that, like a in that that non title match that they had, I think it was like yeah, no surrender. But like that, that is the frustrating part. That like when they moved him out of the X division, which was more or less like May two thousand six. Like he went into a main event match, uh, teaming with Sting against Steiner and Joe. He then went into a pay per view match against Steiner that he won. He went into like a little feud with Rhino and Monty Brown, which he also won. Uh, you know, and then he went into that Jarrett match and won, which was is is like the the grooming for the main event push. Like he's beating all these heavyweight wrestlers. They they did successfully transition him out of the X division into the heavyweight division, and then when the moment came at the end of 06 when he should have won the belt he did not win the belt and like there is the altered history like if Russo doesn't come in if you don't get Russo if Angle doesn't come in even you probably get to Samoa Joe winning the belt faster but that like combination of new booker new shiny toy coming in at the same time just dumped Samoa Joe like five people back in the line right I want to I want to talk about that Genesis 2006 match with Kurt Angle. So this is the the famous match that main events Genesis, of course, and it's not for the world title because why would it be? Um <laughs> but that Sting is world champs. Yeah. Losing by DQ to Abyss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Causing but, a title change because TNA. <laughs> but this this is the main this is the main this was the main event and this um did set their pay-per-view record. Um it's I don't think it so what's what's their pay-per-view record now? For which do you know what show has the highest pay-per-view buys? Point to um, Dave, it's hard to kill 2024. <laughs> is it really? I'm not sure about the exact numbers, but that's according to Dave's reporting that that's yeah. apparently the, the hot most bought pay-per-view in TNA history. It's either that or like Genesis 2006 or Lockdown 2008. Yeah. Both Angle Joe matches, whichever take your choice. Yeah. But uh th those are the two before apparently hard to kill 2024. So um that match, and I was uh this this one of the good things about Samoa Joe, uh, I guess, is that he has a lot of full matches of him on YouTube, which made it very easy to watch matches for this podcast because I was just watching them. And there's matches between Ring of Honor uploads, uh, TNA uploads on YouTube. Uh, I don't know who is responsible for running that channel, but they're doing <laughs> a great job. Great. Uh, Give them um, and uh, and even WWE has quite a few of like major Samoa Joe matches that are on YouTube. So if you want to watch some Samoa Joe, just type his name into YouTube and like Samoa Joe full match. And you can see matches for like the past 20 plus years of his career. Not um, to go on like oh, a wrestling casual fan rant, but we, we are in like a borderline unprecedented era where it is so easy to watch the best matches in wrestling history. Like it has never been easier to do a deep dive into literally anybody's career more often than not, as he mentioned, without even paying any money. You don't even have to give WWE Network any money for this stuff. You can just type the person's name into YouTube and you'll be able to watch at minimum like 15 of their best matches. So like... The whole like, oh, how am I supposed to know who they are thing? Ugh. Yeah, like the last the last few years, WWE has has uploaded a lot of stuff onto YouTube. Um and the WWE YouTube channel has like nice, really long like playlists, like or not playlists, but it'll be like one of those like it'd be like, you know, four hours of like classic Undertaker matches or whatever. And they'll just be it's it's basically like one of those like compilation DVDs, but just on a YouTube video. 
Um, and they have a lot of those and, and ring of honor and the TNA channels have had, have been uploading full matches, um, for, for forever. But, um, Anyway, I, I was able to watch, I watched this Genesis match um, against Kurt Angle, uh, and the match is great. Like, I hadn't seen it in a very long time, but this is, like, an awesome match between Samoa Joe and Kurt Angle. And it feels like a really big deal when the they get a big bell pop. I think they, they do the This Is Awesome chant right from the, from the opening bell. Um, but... The big question in this is that Samoa Joe comes in with an 18-month unbeaten streak, and Kurt Angle beats him. And Kurt Angle's still pretty new to the company at this time. And I think in hindsight, there's been a lot of discussion about, well, what was the right decision? Was it, you know, should 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 Samoa Joe have lost to Kurt Angle? Should he have lost to this WWE guy? Um, wh what is kind of your take on that, the result of that? Genesis 2006 match, whether or not that was a particularly damaging decision to have Samoa Joe lose that match. Yeah, like it's tough because you bring Angle in and you want to do something interesting with him at first, and you have Samoa Joe right there. Like, like that's the match everybody probably thought of the second Kurt Angle was signed with TNA. Like him wrestling AJ, him wrestling Joe. Those were probably like the two matches that immediately mm -hmm. sprung to people's mind. And arguably, you could have done AJ before you did Joe, but Joe was probably the more compelling. Like, they did that first pull apart on Angle's debut, and it was magic. Like, it was actual magic pro wrestling. So, like, it was immediately that kind of match that, like, what people were salivating for. But then, as you said, like, Angle shouldn't lose his first match. He shouldn't. Like, you, you're spending a lot of money to bring in Kurt Angle. He's a big star. He should not be losing his first match. So then, arguably, you don't book him against Samoa Joe. But when you do, you kind of have to have Angle win. And like Joe won the next month, which kind of, I think, ultimately serves nobody because Joe's lost and Angle's lost. So good, great job, guys. Both guys have now lost. You haven't done anybody any favors. Like for, for me, I, I've always said like main event should have been Joe and Jared at Bound for Glory. And then I would have spent a year getting to Angle Joe at Bound for Glory the next year. And then Angle can beat Joe. He's been there a year. Joe's at the world title a year. You're not actually ruining anything. Like you, you've had like, and I think it would be a bigger match if you could do it the year later. But like, I understand why Angle won. And I understand why they did Angle Joe as Angle's first match. But it... It's not the decision I would have made. And like Joe could have recovered from that. And Joe did recover from that, more or less. Uh, I, I don't think it's that match result that hurts Samoa Joe as much as it was the fact that the next two years of his career are about, are about him being like Kevin Nash's young boy, <laughs> which is bizarre. The idea that he's like doing a teacher people thing with Kevin Nash and all that stuff and the main event mafia stuff. And then he, he was never like even in the world title picture basically ever again after he lost the belt in 2008. So like, I think it is the, the tale of booking after that, that hurt him a lot more than that particular result. I think he could have, and as it kind of did rebound, re rebound from that result, more or less but like Russo didn't get him and that goes back to like the problem with Samoa Joe in wrestling in 2006 2007 mid 2000s in general like a lot of people didn't get Samoa Joe they looked at that I don't understand how well I do understand he's so it. easy to get this is the <laughs> yeah. so frustrating thing to, like about it is that like he's the easy he's one of the easiest people ever to book as a top guy like mm -hmm. he would easily be he could be a top guy for any time during the top the last 100 years of professional wrestling um his his character is simple every person understands it he can get that character over in like a two minute promo if you've never seen him before and yet he's presented as like this mis like like you're talking about like they didn't like these bookers they didn't get him like what's there to get his name is samoa joe he's the samoan submission machine he's this big tough guy and he's very serious like it, it's this whole approach to like 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 people viewing like wrestling as like the super complicated thing and you've got to have this over-the-top character and it's like no you don't it's like he's so simple yet that his, his the simplicity of him has somehow baffled all of these alleged creative geniuses <laughs> that have been running wrestling for the last 20 years
That's the problem, though. It's the same creative geniuses that were running wrestling in the 90s and who were very out of touch in the 2000s. Because, like, wrestling still hasn't moved on from the Attitude Era. We're still stuck there, like, mentally. We we have not escaped that era of pro wrestling. Even if you look at the, the kind of wrestling that has succeeded over the last decade, when you look at, like, the peak of New Japan, the peak of NXT and then what led into AEW. Like when you look at the style of wrestling that, that, that led to those successes, it is not the same stuff from the 15 years earlier. It is something new, something a little more sincere and something a little more straightforward. But like when you go back to the, the 2006, it's like Vince McMahon is stuck in the past. He, he'll like Vince is going to take one look at Samoa Joe's physique and he's not going to hire him. That's because Vince had severe blinders about the kind of person who can be a star, both from a physique wise and from a height wise. Like name the person that looks like Samoa Joe who has been WWF world champion, you know, Mick Foley, Mick Foley and maybe Yoko Zuda there. And then like name the kind of people who looked like Samoa Joe, who looks like the other kind of person, like big Jack Musley. It's everybody else. Mm -hmm. So you have like two examples, neither of which were real top guys in the company of like big guys. Like Vince couldn't even get Vader, you know, like Vince never got Vader. Yeah. Vince never uh, got another Vader, si never very similar, a very, another very similar, like very simple character to present. Yeah. So like Vince never happened. Like, he is never getting Samoa Joe. Uh, like, uh, TNA, to their credit, like, did. They did a very good job with him until another Vince came along and Vince Russo and his sports entertainment and his car crash TV and his hatred of pro wrestling, which is what it all comes down to. He does not like pro wrestling as a genre of entertainment. He is a failed television writer projecting onto pro wrestling. That's always what he's been. So him coming into TNA, he's also never going to get Samoa Joe because he's going to take one look at this guy and be like, I can't write skits with this guy, which is ultimately what Vince Russo always wants to do. He just wants to write skits. So like Joe had the misfortune of coming up in a scene that like didn't correct until like 2014, 2015 NXT, that the guy, a guy like Samoa Joe is not going to get the opportunities a guy like Samoa Joe deserves because of deep seated, deeply embedded biases within pro wrestling. Because then you're like, oh, well, 2010, you have a whole new regime in TNA. Who is it? It's Eric Bischoff. Take a look at the people Eric Bischoff has presented and treated as stars in his career. Do you think Samoa Joe is a hope? No. So he got stuck with the hacks. He got stuck with the frauds. He got stuck with the same people who are stuck in the same era who did not understand him and did not understand pro wrestling and did not understand their audience. So it is like it is almost a tragedy that you had this guy who is like a once in a generation talent who is, I think, at his peak for me, the best wrestler of all time. Samoa Joe doesn't have the longevity to be the, like the actual best wrestler. But if you were like, who reached the highest peak as a pro wrestler? I think Samoa Joe was in that conversation. And everything conspired so that he, he could not be the star he should have been over the last 20 years. Yeah. And a lot of this goes back to like, you mentioned like Vince wants to push like the big jacked guy. And a lot of that, like, even though Vince McMahon is not running all of these wrestling companies, he's only running WWE, that mentality that he's implemented on all of these other people that have also taken up creative positions has been really damaging. Like, if you look at a lot of the guys that TNA tried to push as, like, homegrown original guys, um, they tried to push a lot of people. I think we talked about this last time you were on my show. But like in like the 2010s when there was so much indie talent that was available, but they were interested in pushing Crimson and Rob Terry and Gunner and these guys that have the body that Vince would want to push. Even though Vince McMahon was not running TNA, his influence on like who could be a top guy, which is you got to have a bodybuilder physique, was still um, having a major impact in hurting people like Samoa Joe, even though he wasn't even in WWE. And then when you think about the kind of people who are who are booking DNA, you had Vince Russo, who was a, originally a WWF television writer. You had Bruce Pritchard, who is very much a deep in the wool WWE guy. Um, you have Dave Lagana, who came from WWE. You have uh, John Gaborik, who came from WWE. So like you, you even like though Vince is not there himself, you do have 
as you said, his influences kind of trickling down to the rest of the industry, either through just the general way he sees pro wrestling and people trying to emulate WWE, or like directly through people who worked under him and like believe in his philosophies, then spreading their wings and going elsewhere and corrupting the rest of pro wrestling. Mm -hmm. And going back to like this Genesis 2006 match, um, to me, it's like some you know, Samoa Joe, he had the 18th month undefeated streak. He he was eventually gonna have to lose to somebody. And and ultimately, I think losing to a debuting a debuting Kurt Angle in like this much hyped match is not a terrible way for his undefeated streak to end. Um, when you have like these kind of long undefeated streaks, sometimes it become a booking challenge to kind of okay, how is this actually gonna end in in a way that feels satisfying? And I think. You know, TNA, and they're far from the only company that's ever done this, but TNA had the reputation, has the reputation for, you know, signing a WWE guy and immediately pushing them over their their own talent. And usually that WWE guy is well past their prime or wasn't, you know, either a has been or a never was. Um, and this is, I'm going to bring up a random example and it's bad because I don't remember the actual result. Who who did Sean Morley beat like on his TNA debut? Didn't Chris he... Daniels, one month removed from Chris Daniels main eventing a pay-per-view against AJ Styles for the world championship. Thank you. So like, yeah, that that's the example of like bad, the bad decision where it's just like Sean Morley, who, who was Val Venus, um, like, just he gets immediately he gets a like immediate un, a push and it's literally only because he was in WWE for a little bit like there's no value there other than the idea that he has a WWE name and he immediately gets pushed over an established TNA name that's what I think people think about when they think about TNA unfortunately is that kind of decision making and I think sometimes like Angle beating Joe at Genesis 2006 is lumped into that but Kurt Angle in 2006 was still very much viewed as being in his prime as a wrestler. He was WWE world champion just earlier that year. Um, he was still wrestling at a really high level, despite some of the personal problems he was going through at the time. Um, I don't, he still had aura as like a top guy. I don't think Kurt Angle is not the kind of guy who, who like came into TNA past his prime and then was over pushed. I think they ultimately, you know, they got a top guy and they presented him as a top guy. Um, that had a, an immense amount of credibility um, to all wrestling fans. So I don't really see that as a major issue. And like you said, it's more of how Samoa Joe would eventually be followed up um, after that. That would be a bigger problem. Um, and you mentioned like he he kind of ends up being, you know, Kevin Nash's understudy and kind of gets sucked in as like kind of like the, the young boy as the main event mafia eventually, um, for lack of a better term. And that comes back to a different mentality issue, which is, well, Samoa Joe has never been on WWE TV. And he's never been like a national TV star. So he needs to be with these other big names to like learn how to be a star, even though with probably the exception of Kurt Angle, Samoa Joe is seen as a bigger star by the TNA fan base um, by that point than, than, than like a Kevin Nash. Yeah, which was the remarkable thing about Joe that like literally no matter how badly they would book him, he would still be over. Like he would still have that connection with the audience, like and they would do their damnedest to remove it. But like Joe would come out and he'd get one of the biggest reactions, particularly when they did like impacts on the road or impacts in the UK, especially. Like Joe would be one of the top like three most over guys in the room. To because me he's Samoa Joe, he has that like he has that built in connection to the audience that they just, as you said, didn't understand because he didn't work up north. Yeah. And, and to me as a fan, um, AJ Styles is like the most the star, I would say, is the most synonymous with TNA. But Samoa Joe is the second in that in that ranking, I would say, like when I think of TNA. Uh, I think of AJ Styles and then I think of Samoa Joe. I think his name is pretty synonymous with that company uh even though he hasn't worked there in 10 years yeah especially when you're, you're talking homegrown guys like uh it is probably styles joe james storm technically not a homegrown person but i think a person you associate a lot more with tna but gail kim might throw in there as well as somebody who is like very much an, an iconic tna figure like like tna figure especially as opposed to being uh, an iconic wrestling figure like a sting or a kurt angle who also has a, a deep attachment somewhere else yeah i would uh, say like uh christopher daniels um uh, Robert Roode, 
Yeah, um, you get the whole other tier, like Chris Saban, Alex Shelley, Rude, yeah. uh, those, those, Frankie Kazarian, another one. You know, those kind of guys, Eric Young, that 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 like are, are not like the tippy top tier, but then they're like the the, the second tier, if you will. If you're if you're doing the Mount Ra- Ra- Rushmore, they're like smaller little statues you built below <laughs> Rushmore. They're like these guys were there too. <laughs> yeah, Kyoshi. Um... Oh yeah, hell yeah. Can't think of, can't forget about him. The um, but he he's. He's synonymous with TNA, and like it's really interesting. Like, so he, I don't really remember this happening in real time, even though I was watching at the time. He, he, so he, he eventually wins the world title by beating Kurt Angle, um, in, in, uh, was it was that lockdown, right? Yeah, it was lockdown to this day because it's a cage match. So he kind of, even though he beat Kurt Angle at turning point right after kind of losing that Genesis match in 2006. The lockdown match is kind of his real revenge because he beats him for the title. Um, I also watched that match. It's on YouTube. Um, do you remember that match at all? Yeah, it's their really interesting Kurt Angle, I want to do MMA match. Oh my God. Kurt Angle in this match is, it's it's not a bad, it's not a bad match, but it's so different than their Genesis match because Kurt Angle is doing a full-blown MMA gimmick like across the board he's wearing fight shorts and no shoes he um is really like cut like he's very thin um who was doing commentary i think it was a frank trigg that was frank doing... trigg was on commentary he's yeah. actually pretty darn good as well yeah he's he was a pretty good for for you know a, a guy who's not a professional wrestling color commentary guy he was pretty good at like selling the characters and stuff like that um it's just this you know tna tried to do this more than wwe and it, it, it there's there's reasons why it made sense for them to do this but tna did go through this phase where like they really wanted to kind of attach themselves to the mma the rise of mma and there were a lot of guys that an angle being one of them but like were like yeah i want to incorporate mma to my wrestling style and the a lot in a lot of cases the fans of TNA didn't want to see that. If they wanted to see that, they would watch MMA, which has kind of always been my point when it comes to these kind of MMA gimmicks, especially on American TV. Which is if I wanted to see like real grappling, I would just watch one of my the numerous MMA options that are available to me as a viewer. And in this match, people are chanting, you know, we want wrestling, we want wrestling. Um, meanwhile, they're doing, you know, their their UWFI gimmick. <laughs> um, which some people probably really enjoyed, but it's just it's a very strange match if you ever go back and watch it. It is like it's an interesting phase in era in wrestling history where like UFC was taking off as this thing was really, really popular and becoming increasingly more popular than wrestling was. So like there there was always this talking point of like, what can wrestling learn from UFC? What can wrestling take from what UFC is doing, apply to what they're doing and and have some elements of the same success? And when that actually happened in practice, it was always the wrong things. Like, like they, they didn't take two people who are serious and want to fight each other, which is the core of MMA and the reason yeah, people, that people care about believe it. that these guys don't like each other. And because they the combat is real, it sells that these real personalities as opposed to the fake personalities of pro wrestling. Yeah, so pro wrestling's takeaway was like, let's have guys do weird shooty things. I think the Angle Joe match is like an, a, a, an interesting historical artifact just for that kind of mentality. And yeah. like the, the match becomes more of a pro wrestling match as the match goes on. And it could be it naturally, it becomes a better match as the match goes on, as they just slip more into the, like their natural pro wrestling instincts. But like that that era, like you had the same stuff, like Ring of Honor did a bunch of it as well, with like Davey Richards and Eddie Edwards and like the 2011 with fight camps and all that stuff. And it's like, that's not what people want from like, that. that's not what people are talking about when they say, what can you learn from the UFC? It's like, how can you present these people more realistically as people that hate each other? That's all you wanted to, to take from the UFC. Not like do weird grappling on the mat for the first half of your match or not like send Davey Richards and his weird friends to fight camp with kyle o'reilly it's like none of that like you just want seriousness brought back to pro wrestling so that people actually invest in characters that want to kill each other which is the core of the industry which has been so badly lost over time 
But um, I like I like that match. I think it's an interesting match. It's an interesting match, as you said, to look back on and be like, look at this weird moment in time where wrestling was becoming a little bit insecure, I think, about the fact that UFC was overtaking it. And then being like, how can we react to that? And like TNA has always been like weirdly in bed with MMA because you had like Tito Ortiz doing stuff in 2005. Then you had TNA, uh, which was... You, uh, at the start of its era on Spike, it aired after the Ultimate Fighter. So, like, Ultimate Fighter was always a uh, UFC and uh, TNA were air- aired on the same network and had some crossover at the start before, before UFC took off and then left Spike. And then you had the TNA Bellator stuff as well, which was a, a television crossover, which had the famous Tito Ortiz moment again in 2014, uh, walking out, or 2013 even. Was um, it, the, it was the August warning. In the August first warning, the famous Ken Anderson rubbing his head. <laughs> there's no reaction at all. So there's there is the like TNA's weird crossovers with MMA, but that that match does stand uh, in a moment in time. I think about res- uh, like wrestling's relationship with MMA and how it has developed, and wrestling ultimately grew out of trying to like emulate or be like MMA. That's not a thing people talk about anymore. I think people just accept that they're different things. Yeah, and and it was it was like a huge contrast because I watched the 2006 Genesis match, like, and then the cage match, like back to back, and it's like the the 2006 Genesis match is very much like this classic pro wrestling match. It's got the feel of it, you know. They wrestle it like it's a normal pro wrestling match. Kurt Angle does a blade job, like it's it's a really good match. And then I'm like, all right, let's watch this 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 when when Samoa Joe kind of got his big win back you know, beating him for the world title in 2008. And it's like, even though it's not that much long, like uh, older, it's like only a little, it's like 18 months in the future. And it's like, what is this? Like Kurt Angle looks completely different. Um, He's wearing fight shorts, which I never remembered him ever wearing fight shorts. Um, It's just, it's a very, very weird match. Um, Yeah. And they would never do this. Like like, Kurt only did this. Like, because I, I remember reading like media interviews where Kurt was like, me and Joe are putting together something really different, you know, or, or th- this match is going to be something unlike you've ever seen before. And like, obviously, like, like shoot style wrestling exists before this match and exists after this match. So it's not that unique. But in yeah. the context of TNA, like th- it is something they, they never did like, like before and then never did again. Kurt Angle was back to a singlet for every other match he ever did. Yeah, you know, there was a, around the same time, wasn't there a AJ Styles match on pay-per-view where he wrestled an actual MMA fighter? It was Frank Trigg. They spent the year building right. to AJ and Frank Trigg on pay-per-view on No Surrender that year, and it was not very good. You'll be shocked to learn. Well, I remember that. I remember watching that match, and they're doing, like, the worked MMA feud, and everyone else, everyone in the audience is like, what the hell is going on? Why isn't AJ Styles doing cool flips? Like, it, yeah, it's you, one you, thing you, for you... Kurt Angle, who's, like, the Olympic gold medalist, to kind of do that, and it's, like, another thing, it's, like, oh, AJ Styles, who's, like, one of the most exciting athletic wrestlers, is now going to have, like, a grappling match. You're like, I paid for a ticket to go see TNA, one of TNA's only pay-per-views in Canada, up until the, the more recent stretch, where, where TNA have a lot more shows in Canada. But you're like, I finally get to see TNA live on pay-per-view and in my city. What's the age? Frank Trigg. AJ Styles is wrestling Frank Trigg. I finally get to see AJ and he's wrestling Frank Trigg. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that poor audience must have wanted to strangle somebody. Yeah. The um it, in and to touch on the MMA thing again because I think it's a, it's important to bring up like I think a lot of Samoa Joe's appeal is related to I think the MMA influence in yeah if you America. if you listen like Mike Mike Tanay would, would would say that on commentary when he debuted it's like you, you see his style is very much MMA influenced with the submissions and the strikes right but in a good useful way like that's, like that's you said still taking, pro wrestling taking the the right lessons from MMA which is like very serious um competitor comes across like a legit badass um, believable physicality i think is the yep, important part yep um his whole persona you know he uh, he's got the he's got the the shorts and he's got the kick pads and that kind of thing but he's you know you can get a lot of it is you know also like you know Puro inspired which is also kind of connected to the mma world like 90s Puro and mma and those kind of things because it worked so well incorporating shoot style into 90s and 2000s Puro as well didn't it <laughs> That went the, really in well a, in the nineties. It did. I mean, we were talking about like it, like, it, it did at the stars. <laughs> yeah, well, like 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 Samoa Joe's. You know, just in a lot of ways, like the who's the most obvious person to compare Samoa Joe to in professional wrestling history is is Shinya Hashimoto, right? Yeah. As like in terms of just like just like he just he looks like Shinya Hashimoto, like as far as just like his physic his physique, 
Um, and that was clearly a lot of his inspiration. And I know Samoa Joe did tours with Zero One, um, you know, early in his career in the early 2000s. So it's like very clearly influenced um, by Hashimoto in a lot of different ways, but like in a good way, like he took, like, like you said, those good lessons from, I think, MMA as opposed to like wearing, uh, you know, fight shorts and no shoes um, and, and that kind of thing. I've also heard that, uh, I had this pointed out to me once um, by somebody and it was like Samoa Joe was a real um, trailblazer for Samoan wrestlers in general that like, with uh, the exception of The Rock, like Samoan wrestlers before Samoa Joe had been presented in one very uh, specific and stereotypical way. Um, and Samoa Joe was like the first Samoan wrestler to wear boots and like the first one to like be able to speak and not just scream like every other Samoan wrestler before him. So he's a true, like the difference between like Samoa Joe and Umaga, rest in peace Umaga, uh, are pretty different. Um, yeah, well, I, I'd imagine like that was one of Joe's bigger fears about going to WWE at the time. Just like the second oh, Vince sees a Samoan, yeah. he's like Vince oh, rubbing fuck, his no. hands together, like oh, a Samoan. Um, but I think, and I think that's that's part of the whole package with him. And I think one of the things about him is like his name is like perfect, like Samoa Joe is a great fucking wrestling name it is memorable and it is perfect for him it is straight and to the point he's samoa joe his name is joe he's samoan he's samoa joe it sounds kind of like a street name like in a cool way like you could see like a character on the wire being called samoa joe um and it's super memorable and i'm glad he's never had to change it for any reason uh and i think it's helped his career because i think like people who are maybe casual fans or didn't maybe watch a ton of tna but maybe were aware of who the absolute top guys were i think like samoa joe being samoa joe it's just it's a super memorable name and it's so straightforward there's like it's it just sounds violent i don't know like it's it's just maybe it's because i associate with him it just it's such a perfect ring name and i don't think it gets enough credit it's also just fun to say. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's like it's just the collection of words Samoa Joe. It's just it feels good in the mouth. Yeah, like oh, who's that guy? Oh, that's Samoa Joe. Like yeah. it just sounds badass. It's a good collection of words. He um, and and so when I was watching a lot of these Samoa Joe matches uh, leading up to this podcast, and one thing that really hit me was like Samoa Joe is one of the most enduring durable wrestling stars i think in wrestling history in in terms of his character has not evolved in 25 years yeah he is the exact same like persona as he was when he debuted in like 1999 he um his 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 look hasn't really changed outside of his him the period where he dyed his hair blonde. Um, he's basically hey, don't you dismiss Nation of Violence tattoo oh, yeah. face. Looks I, forgot, so I forgot about. How speaking. dare you? Yes, yes. <laughs> he uh, his uh yeah his um slipped back into was was Vince McMahon booking that period of uh. Well, you got Russo. It's close yeah. enough. Yeah, that's true. Another Vince was there, um, but his 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 gear has basically been the same. He's come out with a towel and the the same style of shorts and kick pads. Yeah, uh, the dual colored shorts have been a trademark the whole time. Even the style of shorts have changed, but they've always been like the split dual color thing. Yeah, again, very like puro, like and and the black and red being Shinya Hashimoto colors. Uh his his move set really hasn't changed at all. I was watching this and it's like I was watching a 2003 match from Ring of Honor that he had with AJ Styles, and he's like he literally does all of the same moves he does now. Like mm -hmm. there's almost no difference. Um, he, he is it, one, like the most enduring wrestlers literally ever in just terms of, and yeah, he's been kind of up and down, but he's always given off the presentation of, of being a main eventer or capable of being a main event talent. He has done it in every promotion. Uh, he's, he's basically ever been in. He, even when he was in WWE, 
Like, and he wasn't necessarily always presented as a top guy. Like when he would get those opportunities, like when he had that the, that program with Brock Lesnar, which did do really good business and actually moved te television ratings during a time where that was very difficult for WWE. Um, uh, you know, I watched a world title match he had uh, uh, at Payback against Seth Rollins. Like, even though he was in WWE, which is like this kind of the system where no one ever thought he would be able to be successful in, and it took him so long to kind of eventually get hired there. Uh, he's still just Samoa Joe. He's really, he's not a compromised character really at all when he was in WWE. Um, so whether he was in TNA, whether he's in WWE, whether he was in the Indies, whether he's in AEW now, he's still just Samoa Joe. He's the same guy as he was when he first debuted in like, you know, um, in, in was UPW in, in Southern California. Like he is um, just super durable. Like, and he can be, he can be beaten and he can still maintain his aura because of his ability to project himself. And all he needs to do is get occasionally like a big win on television. And he'll probably maintain that aura forever. And he's he's going to be 45, I believe tomorrow. I was looking at this, like his birthday is uh, tomorrow. We're recording this on March 16th. So his birthday is tomorrow. Um, so he's going to be 45 tomorrow. But as long as his body holds up and he's his he's been in seemed like pretty good health since he's been in AEW, like he could continue in this role for for several more years at least, um, because he is he's so durable as a top guy. It is interesting to say that as a positive that like you know traditionally the thing we put over in wrestling is people's ability to adapt to people's ability to re reinvent themselves like we talk about like hogan and then nwo hogan or jericho and the various versions of jericho that's been through the years or sting from surfer to to crow to joker you know we we we, we generally put over people who have had longevity terry funk is another great example of a man who was more than willing to move with the times but like that's the thing we generally put over with pro wrestlers that like oh you know they, they were a thing that was successful here and they were able to change to be successful in a different era it's kind of remarkable to bring that up for Samoa Joe that like he is like, like enduring he is like the same person he's always been and he's never needed to be anything else it's really interesting that like like for the most part, if you had a wrestler who was the same, like the exact same, and the way Samojo has been for twenty five years, they would get stale. Like they they would have to change. Like they would have to change, or else they would just fall away. Whereas Samoa Joe, maybe it's some combination of the fact that he has moved around a little bit. Like he went from Ring of Honor to TNA to WWE to well to NXT to WWE to AEW. So he had he has like there was like a nine year stint is probably the longest there is TNA run. But like he has moved around. And Enough that like you can bring what Samoa Joe is to a new place without having to change it but like it is kind of remarkable it does speak to his like enduring appeal that like he hasn't had to change like he could just be Samoa Joe that is how like timeless he is as a pro wrestling character that you can slot him in in all these companies and all these different time periods against all these different generations of wrestlers and he doesn't need to reinvent himself he can just be Samoa Joe and be just as successful as he was in 2005 in 2024 by just being himself which is like the, the like he is almost like the purest distillation of a pro wrestling character which goes back to your frustration earlier about how he how easy he is the book like he is like the best parts of pro wrestling like melted down into a performer and that's the reason he doesn't need to reinvent himself he doesn't need to become a new character he doesn't need paint on his face or whatever they try to do in tna he could just be some mojo and he'll be the most over popular guy on the roster yeah, he like you said, he he's never had he's never gotten stale, so he's never had to reinvent himself. Like I think one of the reasons Jer like one of the things about Jericho is as much as we praise his his creativity and his ability to reinvent himself, it's become because his characters kind of burn out very quickly. He tends um, to run some stuff into the ground. Yeah, and so he's always kind of had to pivot, and and unlike most wrestlers, he's not just playing the hits. He he's wanting to continue to kind of. Or reinvent himself to, to to spring towards the next thing, but Samoa Joe's never had to do that, and I think that's a good way a good way to describe it is how he did is it's like the purest distillation of a pro wrestling character, which is his character is so simple that it allows him to be um, kind of blend into anything because 
there'll no matter what changes in the pro wrestling industry take place, there has always been a place for a menacing tough guy that has that kind of instant credibility. Um, the person he reminds me a lot of when I was just kind of watching him and noticing like, wow, this guy hasn't changed at all is like a lot of the praise that I think like Minoru Suzuki gets, which is like Minoru Suzuki is kind of like he's been this enduring um, heel challenger for such a long period of time and he can lose big matches but still maintain his aura in that kind of way and i think samoa joe is very much like that in the, for american wrestling in the sense of he's always had credibility he'll always have credibility he doesn't have to be booked on an 18 month undefeated streak to maintain that credibility i always think that's a like a really big science like anyone can win a million matches and kind of get over for being undefeated for a while we've seen that gimmick for a lot of different wrestlers and once they lose it becomes obvious that they lost a lot of their aura and that has really never been the case for Samoa Joe he can lose big matches and he still maintains that credibility still maintains that aura never grows stale never has to be reinvent himself like what would even be a reinvention of Samoa Joe like what would that even be I don't even want to picture it Garrett Mm, tna tried <laughs> yeah they did their damnedest yeah and you know i watched some of his later tna stuff i watched him he wrestled i watched a match he had with austin aries um where oh, he the lost. Summer 2012 one? yeah that might have been it I, I forget what show it was actually on but it probably was that so you know austin aries went over and it's like um i watched him i did a Air, alan four l's show uh last november and we watched um a TNA show from 2013, uh, an episode of Impact, but it was a special episode. It was with the uh, Ken Anderson, Bully Ray final match for like the end of Aces and Eights. I forget the name. Oh, of so that would have been Turning Point 2013, I guess. That sounds right. Um, and there was like a, they were doing the uh the world title tournaments because AJ Styles was doing his whole like I'm not you know I left the company and I'm going to Japan to defend my title and Dixie Carter's trying to to crown a new champion. And it's like. I, so I, there was a there, in the title tournament, there was like a Magnus Samoa Joe match. And like, you know, Joe, I think he looks the same, but he's just not the same kind of I think there's a motivation issue at that point where he has it's like, oh, Samoa Joe versus Magnus. This should probably be a pretty decent match on paper. And the match is just like a really boring two star match. Like, it's just there's not a whole lot there. Um, so I think towards yeah, when, that... when when you look at Joe, everything after his world title run. Uh, he's never presented as a top guy in that company again, like ever. Like, like there, there's brief moments where he gets main event matches, and some of them are really like he does the Styles Daniels Joe match in 2009 again, and that match I think is arguably better than the first or the, the more famous one that is important too. And like the, the he gets like he main events lockdown 2013 against Magnus. Like there, there is some like or 2014 even there is some um like fleeting moments where like he gets main event matches just to get main event matches. But like he is never a pushed act in that company again, at least as a, a top guy, like ever again, which is like crazy to think about. So when you get to like 2013, 2014, and then it's like start of 2015 when he's still around for a little bit, like you can tell, like, you know, the 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 motivation's not there. And like physically, he's not the same performer. Like he's just not, you know, like that that's that's the reality of it. Like the, you can argue whether it was that sting bump at Bound for Glory 2008 where he took the big drop stick in the stands and landed flat on his back on steps, which you should never do, or like whatever it was that, that like there was some element of physical decline there that like he just wasn't the same Samoa Joe. He didn't hit as hard. He didn't like commit to his moves as much. Like his classic like atomic drop flying boot senton combo. He'd stop taking the bump for the flying boot. He'd just do a running boot. You know there was that kind of stuff where you could see like he was adapting to his physical decline and. As I said, it, he he became a guy who had limitations. You know, he became a guy who still had a lot of very positive qualities in terms of like his aura, his 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 projection, uh, like how much credibility he had. But he he wasn't a guy who could move as well as he used to. So you have to be able to like work around that. And when he's a mid card guy, you're not doing that. And when he's a mid card guy in WWE, you're not doing that. They did a little bit in NXT, but then he'd still have these really long, arduous main events, which I don't think suited who he was. And then, like, finally, as I said, you 
got to AEW and like they put him against Darby Allen and Samoa Joe came back. Like, like you put him against the guy who's willing to eat shit and create tons of movement around Samoa Joe. And suddenly you saw like Samoa Joe again after years of like being stuck in kind of a rut to some combination of physical decline and bad booking. Like it just never really worked for like the best part of a decade until suddenly like he had the right matches at the right time and was protected in the right way in AEW. And suddenly you saw the fullness of Samoa Joe again. And it was like really a revelation because I really didn't think we'd ever see that Samoa Joe again. Like Samoa Joe, Samoa Joe, that really makes you feel something. And the second those Darby Allen matches happened, it, like, it, it was back. He was back. And it was so nice. Yeah, I, I think just like Darby in general, it would probably be my, I think he's probably like, I don't know this because I'm obviously not a wrestler, but I, I would imagine he has to be people's favorite opponent to work with. Yeah, any, any wrestler who's willing to eat shit for you constantly must be so much fun to work. Yeah, like he's, he's really light so you can do a lot of stuff with him and he's not afraid to basically take any bump and he he will make you look like an absolute killer um, out there. Um, but while at the same time he has credibility, so it's not like you're just beating up a jobber. So people, they'll the actual heat for when you like body press him like into the stands, as opposed to if it was just like a jobber who was doing it. Um, yeah, because you could point to like the the Lance Archer Marco stunt match, which is like one of my low key favorite matches in AEW history. That match is so good, but like Lance Archer doing that to Marco stunt doesn't do as much for Lance Archer as Samoa Joe doing that to Darby right. Allen does. I oh well, I think Lance Archer is like an all time squash match worker. So good, like do you, like. That the I, I don't think I'll ever go back and watch it because in, in hindsight they're very depressing. But those AEW shows that were at like QT Marshall's training school and they were built around crowning the first TNT champion and they were really built around like Lance Archer as like the monster in the tournament that Cody was gonna have to face in the finals. Lance Archer for those that like four week taping stretch is so great. Um is that the period where he throws the guy through the ceiling? Oh my god, it is. He throws in and they do this. <laughs> to the backstage segments where like the gimmick was like Lance Archer is just out of control and he is just going to beat up literally anybody that he gets close to. He's like, um, he's like, he's like the, the, this is going to be a, a really weird analogy, but since you're a Disney guy, you remember in Bugs Life, the, uh, the grasshoppers have like that crazy grasshopper who they have like in chains and they can't even like let any of the other grasshoppers near because he's just like insane. And like they threaten yeah. that they're going to let him loose on the ants. That's like Lance Archer. Like he can't literally be near any other human beings or he's just going to assault them. Yeah. And they, they go backstage and he, I don't even know what he does. He, he goes, does he choke slam the guy or he like, he just like picks a guy up. And like he basically, this... like, he, he, he basically like grabs him by the collar and just throws him upwards. Yeah, he goes he goes through the ceiling. That's the only way to describe it. He goes through the ceiling. And not only that, he grabs another guy and he choke slams him. And like he's holding him over a trash can. And you're like, well, like he can't choke slam that guy like into the trash can. The guy won't fit in the trash can. But he does. He choke slams him right into a <laughs> trash can. It is arguably my favorite 20 seconds in the history of T of AEW. It's so good. Um, but anyway, yeah, like, like even when you're describing kind of like Samoa Joe, like even in his down period in TNA, um, and he's not nearly doing as much and he's he's not as protected. As a fan watching at that time, I still believed in Samoa Joe as a top guy. Like if they were to put him in the main event, I wouldn't be like, oh, Samoa Joe is in the main event. He's been, you know, he's been, you know, washed for years. It's like I would still be like clapping my hands back. Oh, yeah, Samoa Joe. Like he always maintained that level of credibility when he would say like his booking really didn't deserve it. And it's the reason you could put him in there with like he had that like he'd come out because when he was building to like that main event against uh, Magnus at lockdown 2014, he just do like squashes on TV and it helped that like the the a lot of the impacts leading into that were in the UK. So like he'd come out and he just squashed like bad bones on TV and like he looked like the best wrestler in the world again because he's Samoa Joe and like the really important part of like no matter what they did to him, no matter how badly they booked him. He always had that connection with the audience. He never lost that, which is the reason you could just be like, he's the challenger of the month for Magnus and people would believe in him and people would be excited for him being in a main event. 
because he he never somehow like I I'm not sure how he managed it given the the ups and downs of the booking of his last seven years in TNA, but like he never lost that connection with the audience. The audience never lost faith in him the way you see the audiences lose faith in guys, like the way you see like Adolf Ziggler in WWE. How over time, like the crowd were super into him, but over time every down would bring them a little further away from believing in Dolph Ziggler to the point that then he'd become just a guy and no one would believe in him in the end. That never really happened with Samoa Joe somehow. And I think it goes back to like what I mentioned at the start, like his believability and his connection with the audience kind of stopped that from happening for him yeah and it's like one of those things where it's like is it possible that his like him being so easy to book was in some ways worked against him because eventually you know i think a lot of the bookers that were booking him were incompetent so i don't know how much they realized this but did they did any of them come across the idea it's like you know what we don't actually have to protect this guy because he'll always have his heat yeah, we don't even have to try. Hell yeah. Like, like seriously, like you could always he's always there to be heated back up, heated up. And I think like AEW now has a lot of guys that they could do that with. Um, you look at guys in the roster, it's like this guy's not really doing a lot. But if we had to, if we really needed like a, a a main event challenger for something, we could just give this guy a few wins and have him couple cut a few promos and he'll get back on track. And that's basically kind of what they did with him like joe lost his world title match at um the arthur ash show in uh in i don't know if it, i can't remember if it was august or september of last year and it was like he's right, also he... fresh off losing to cm punk in wembley so it's not like he, he went into that match winning either yeah so he lost it was kind of like okay that was like a good title defense for mjf like to have in new york city you know samoa joe was a good guy to plug into that spot but he never kind of fell out of the world title pitcher um all the way and when it was time for mjf to drop the title for whatever reason like you know he was there um and you could have could you have given that opportunity to hangman page yes could you have been even given that opportunity to someone like swerve who you're just trying to you know strap the rocket to if you want to it's like you could have done that but samoa joe was there and no one has a problem with him being champion out of all you know for a company that has absolutely uh there's no shortage of like bad faith criticisms i haven't heard a single person be like oh samoa joe is the world champion like why despite the fact that he is you know almost 45 years old and that's probably almost a bigger testament to, to him than almost anything else which is that like no one has criticized him as world champion in a company that is full of uh unnecessary bad faith criticisms being levied at it yeah, we talked about those two matches, the the Punk match against uh, at All In in Wembley and the, the MJF match in Arthur Rash. And it, it speaks to like a, a thing that you didn't have a ton of experience with with Joe because like he would work at TNA and Ring of Honor. But like, man, what a great big building wrestler he is. Like, like the way he mm -hmm. projects himself to a large audience. Go back and watch that Wembley match where Punk or uh, Joe is having the time of his life eating Joe up or eating punk up, swinging him into the announce table. Like everything about Samoa Joe's performance is like a perfect big stage performance. And it's the same thing with the MJF match where like I've always said like that there is very little I enjoy more than Samoa Joe just eating somebody alive. It's what makes like all, most of his best matches great in that like the, the Joe's heat segments are better than anybody else's heat segments because Joe just tries to kill a guy. But it's uh, the best thing about like the AJ matches in 2005 because AJ is like the most insane bumper of all time and Joe is willing to kill him. So like they're the perfect combination imaginable. So, but like watching those matches, you're like, oh, this guy pops on these big stages unlike a lot of people. And it like there, there's a lot of people who I think have influence in wrestling today, who are influential, who who like people look to and, and like those are like the people they are emulating. And I don't see a lot of people doing that with Samoa Joe. And it drives me crazy. It drives me absolutely nuts that you don't see people trying to emulate the kind of wrestler Samoa Joe is, because I don't think there's any path to rest the success in wrestling faster than trying to be like Samoa Joe. He should be one of the most influential wrestlers of his generation. Everybody should be studying Samoa Joe. Everybody should be watching his matches, should be watching his promos, should be looking in the man's eyes when he speaks to learn how you should do pro wrestling. And everyone's just trying to do Will Ospreay odds cutters instead, and it drives me mad. Yeah, you know, one of the things with... um that is i wonder if that you know really does date back like again it all comes back to like 
the way bookers have seen him over the years. And that's kind of limited like his ability to influence the next generation of wrestlers in the sense of like, you're hundred percent right. Like he should be emulated by everyone. Again, it's, it's the simplicity of it where you think this would be so easy to do. And yet it is so difficult. Like you think what he does is so simple that you wonder like, why can't every wrestler at least copy parts of this? Why do they have to copy Shawn Michaels? Um, or use Will Ospreay as a good example. Like, why do they have to copy these guys who, especially like Will Ospreay, are, are probably are doing seemingly, seemingly much more complicated things. Um, but Samoa Joe is there as like this eternally over guy. Uh, and yet he hasn't had the same influence. And I, I do wonder if that's like, because he has rarely been kind of featured as a top top guy in various different wrestling companies he just people don't see him as someone worthy of emulating um even though his work should probably be emulated by everyone um or is it just you know we're to, you know i'm not a wrestler I don't, you're not a wrestler like maybe we're just we're really taking for granted how much skill is involved in his performance which we probably are to a degree when we talk about how simple it is um but it's clearly something that very few wrestlers have been able to replicate. And I don't know if that's because of the skill level that it takes to replicate something like that or whether or not these people are trying or not. Yeah, I think a little bit of it is like out of sight, out of mind. That like Samoa Joe hasn't been like a truly, but bar his current run, hasn't been like a truly relevant wrestler as a top guy or like meaningfully since 2008, basically, since he lost the world title in TNA. So like... There's a little bit of that, like basically 15 year stretch or so, where he he was a little bit out of sight. He wasn't like the top guy or the most meaningful guy. He wasn't like the best guy on TV every week, so that people would be seeing him right in the front of their mind. And then the other part is probably because it's really hard. Like the probably the best, the easiest way to mask your shortcomings as a pro wrestler is to do a ton of moves. Like which is the reason you see young wrestlers always doing tons of moves because like you could do tons of moves and they seem really impressive and people don't realize you're bad. Like that that's the real like, like realistically how it is. As opposed to Samoa Joe, where so much of what he does is mastery of craft. It's like mastery of timing, mastery of physicality, mastery like the mastery of like the moments in between. Like he is not a guy who is constantly doing something. He's a guy who's perfectly content just locking in a hold and making that hold mean something. So like Samojo is almost and like that's again, it's the most frustrating part. Because like the old timers you'd hear would always be like, oh, slow down, make moves count, don't rush, don't do a million things. And Samoa Joe is like the personification of that. And yet those same old timers would probably be like, oh, that guy can't be a star. It's so annoying. Yeah, I was uh, like, I mentioned his Hashimoto influence. I, I dug this quote up. This is Samoa Joe writing about working with Shinya Hashimoto um, after Hashimoto died in 2005. And this, these are great quotes because it really embodies kind of a lot of things that we're talking about with Samoa Joe. And he says, when I first started in Japan, my knowledge of Hashimoto was limited, albeit somewhat educated. It was only when I began to wrestle across the ring from the man that I truly realized what it meant to be a star. Hashimoto's ambience did not lie in a flashy gimmick, trend-setting reinvention, or the intangible coolness of his musketeer brethren. Hashimoto had forgone the pomp and circumstance of wrestling and simply sought to be the embodiment of an ideal. The ideal was that the ideal that was was the founding principle of the dojo that produced him when he was which was derived from the centuries-old warrior customs of his culture. Hashimoto embodied Tukan, the fighting spirit. Once at a preliminary training session, Hashimoto had quizzed a group of relatively clueless gaijin about the most important aspect of pro wrestling. Answers sprung forth pleading a case for technique and psychology, but Hashimoto simply pointed at his eyes and said, the fire, the fire, the burning spirit, the unyielding will, even in the face of insurmountable challenges. With a simple gesture and the most intense stare I had ever seen, I understood all these things that I have just listed and nodded in compliance. Like that is Samoa Joe, um, just in those two paragraphs. Like he's clearly copied himself that after Hashimoto, and apparently nobody else has taken that lesson. What we're learning is that Samoa Joe needs to give more dojo speeches. Um, or like Shinya Hashimoto needs to be more influential. Is the thing we're learning too? <laughs> yeah. <God> damn it. <laughs> well, it. <laughs> Yeah, because it's like, man, everyone should listen to that. And it's funny because you talk about like like 
the old timers wanting to, that's like the ideal kind of pro wrestler. It's like, ah, but this guy's fat, so he can't make it as a star, which so stupid. Again, this is always something that's kind of puzzled me, which is like, has, and, and this is maybe like a, um, there's a reason for this, I think that we'll get into, but like, has there ever to your knowledge, cause I was trying to think of people and is the, the, the answer is there's a really limited amount of people that would qualify uh, for this, but has there ever been a wrestler that's been pushed as like a top top star that didn't get over because they didn't have a great physique um so has there ever like so is there a physique that like has the physique ever held somebody back is what you're asking if yeah like the other as skills? a top guy like if they were ever actually sincerely pushed like obviously a physique has hurt people from getting pushed in the first place but has there ever been a guy that like had it all but his body was shit so people didn't like support him I don't think so. Like, because like it would, you, it would be one thing if like the, their body was the thing that limited their performance capacity, which yeah. is like not the case for a Mick Foley or a Samoa Joe or a Vader. So like it, it really is like like, and you see a lot of the guys that we would talk about, like a Vader, is a great example of a guy who wasn't pushed in America how he looked, or at least especially in the WWF, and went to Japan. And he was amazing, you know. So like. When they actually got the opportunity to be a top guy, they could. But as you said, the only reason they weren't is because of how they looked, which it was not actually a limiting factor. So you're right. It, it is basically confirmation bias, isn't it? Right. And I think I think part of it is like if you look at a guy like McFoley, like or, or Dusty Rhodes, you would say like, well, these guys were so ridiculously talented at everything else in pro wrestling that like their body didn't matter. And like the only way you would ever get pushed if you had that kind of body was was if you just had these incredible other skills. But I would always say like the, the thing about Samoa Joe, again, which is also odd, which is like it's one thing if you're – like I feel like if you're over 300 pounds, it's okay to be fat like in pro wrestling, like historically. Like it's like people just accept that you're a big guy. They don't think of you as being like a fat guy, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, like, there's a whole genre of wrestler. Like, no, but if you again, because you can ask like the the flip side of the question is like, how many people who have had the physique but not the other parts have been pushed and succeeded? Yeah, which is like a million people, and they've tried a lot with that, and you might get like two success stories out of like right. seventy. How so, many like, guys? Yeah, like so, like how many guys with great bodies that didn't have a lot of other skills got pushed and didn't get over? Like, yeah, that list is so, endless. And what you realize is that, like, the body, it, not that it doesn't matter, because, like, Ultimate Warrior got over because of how he looked. But he didn't have longevity because he didn't have the other parts. But he did get over because of how he looked. So, right. like, it, it's not the case that there is nothing about how you look that 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 has an effect on uh, your perception as a star. But, like, the important part is, can you work, can you talk? Like, like that's pro wrestling. Pro wrestling is not how you look. It's can you work and can you talk? Yeah, and it's it's just it's always been a weird thing to me. And again, it goes back to like Vince's pension for bodybuilder guys. But it's like to me, it's like you know, Samoa Joe is comes across to me like when he wrestles, like he comes across as a real athlete. Like, okay, yeah, he has um um, you know, he's a chubby guy, but he's not like you don't watch him and you're like, oh man, this guy's really limited by his weight. If anything, it helps because you're like, whoa, this guy's really agile for a guy his size. And when this, you know, this guy's doing a tope suicida and he weighs 300 pounds, like that's really impactful. And the announcers who are, who are good at their job can put that over. And it's always just been so weird to me. I mean, football is the most popular sport in America and it's largely dominated by guys with like similar body types to Samoa Joe. Like, I don't think the viewing public has a hard time like believing that a guy with a little extra weight on him couldn't be perceived as like a tough badass. Like our most popular sport is built around people like that. Um, it's always been like, that's just so strange to me that like, it's like, Oh, you gotta be super jacked to be like a top wrestler. And it's like, that seems to be something that like Vince decided and has kind of influenced everyone else. But if we think about like in real culture, like people are very willing to believe that a six foot one, 300 pound guy is a badass. Like that's, um, our most popular sport is full of them. Like, what what is the problem with that? Yeah, and everybody we named Vince Bungle to some extent. Like Dusty Rhodes, man, did not get him whatsoever. Vader, Vince didn't get him whatsoever. Yeah. Vader was an NFL player. Like, like, what is the problem with like Vader being fat? Like, I don't like. 
It's done. Like Mick Foley was a star in the WWF. You can't take like you can't say he didn't at least help Mick Foley's career, but also he was never the top guy. And the only reason he wasn't was not because of how he worked or how he talked. It was because of how he looked. Like that's the only reason that Vince and like Mick Foley made all of Vince's top guys, which is the irony of it. Like mm-hmm. nearly all of them. Going like all the way through to like Randy Orton and Edge, Mick Foley basically made all of them himself. Um, but Vince would never make Foley the top guy. And then it's such a small Joe, like all these guys, like Vince, it's just a Vince thing. It's just, as we said, Vince is uh, like, because wrestling is WWE, whether you want it to be or not. Like they, even now, wrestling is still WWE, whether you want it to be or not. So like what WWE thinks is wrestling is going to trickle down as what everybody else thinks wrestling should be, which is the reason you constantly get unbearable conversations about like how AEW is terrible and bad just because they're not WWE. And like it just that influence trickles down and it's annoying. And it just means the way Vince saw wrestling trickles down to how everybody else thinks wrestling should be. And we look at like the reality of it and the way Mick Foley and Dusty Rhodes and Vader and all these people with different body types got over elsewhere when given the chance to do so should tell you that Vince is the one who is wrong, but it takes so much to actually overturn opinions like that. Yeah, and I think that's ultimately like the the really frustrating thing about like the creative direction that's been in both WWE and TNA over the last 20 years, which has been so influenced by that limited view on who can be a top star. Um, and, and like, especially with like different people in charge of TNA, it became like this very circular feed where it's like, so Samoa Joe didn't, you know, wasn't, get, wasn't originally recruited by WWE. There's a story about how like in like 2001, 2002, like Samoa Joe was told, I forget who told him this, but someone told him like, WWE will, you'll, will never have interest in you. Like you'll never get a chance in WWE. Um, and kind of because he wasn't in WWE, as different people in TNA um, took creative control and they saw this guy, Samoa Joe, and they would say, yeah, this guy's over with like the TNA hardcore fans, but we're trying to recruit other fans, the casual fan, the WWE fan. So we can't really present this guy. We're going to push somebody who at least has familiarity with the with the WWE viewing audience. And so it became this kind of circular thing with like, because Vince wouldn't be interested in someone like Samoa Joe, Samoa Joe was never on WWE TV. And without being on WWE TV, a lot of people in wrestling didn't thought that he couldn't really be taken seriously as a big star. Um, and that was ultimately kind of really hurt him as terms of eventually being able to, to get a sincere push in TNA after kind of that initial big push. Which really frustrates me because like, if you look at the history of wrestling, how many times is it the case that an old star creates a second new boom period? And the answer is maybe one. You can say Hulk Hogan in the 90s is maybe the only case of an old star getting to do it again, you know? More often than not, boom periods in wrestling are led by new stars. It's led by Hulk Hogan in the 80s. It's led by... Steve Austin and The Rock in the 90s. It's led by John Cena in the 2000s. It's led by, for better or worse, Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns in 2024. Uh, When you asked that question, I was like, well, The Rock's doing pretty good right now. But The the Rock is like one of the two most famous people on earth. Like he is like the the, the broad exception just because he is super famous outside of wrestling now Mm -hmm. too. But like for the most part, the history of wrestling Wrestling is told through creating new stars. New stars lead to creating new fans, which is the thing that is always gets lost and kind of drives me crazy. Like there is this broad focus on trying to bring back casual fans or old fans. And wrestling history has told us when those people are gone, they are gone. When WCW went under, 3 million fans just disappeared. They didn't go watch another stuff. Some of them like trickled down somewhere. Some would wa- end up TNA fans. But for the most part, there was there were there were three million people who would watch Nitro every week on a Monday. And when WCW went under, those people just disappeared because the wrestling they watched went away. So like instead, we spent ten years trying to get those people back. Now we're like, oh, you know, we, we're now in a period of wrestling is more popular than it has been in recent years. But like it, it, over like the last decade, there's a lot of like hand wringing about the, the declining popularity of wrestling and how you get the fans back. And it's always about getting the fans back as opposed to like, what did Bullet Club do? Bullet Club created new fans. 
That's mm -hmm. that's what you have to go after. You can't chase the old ones because for the most part, they're gone or going. You have to go look forward and see what can we do to create new fans and connect with new audiences. And more often than not, the answer to that is creating new stars mm -hmm. for those new audiences to connect with in a modern age. And so the, the idea that you would be like, we can't push Joe this new act because we want to push Kurt Angle or Sting or somebody we, who we believe has more cash with a larger audience you're you're like it's like it's a short-term gain because it is probably true in like the immediate short term pushing Kurt Angle will do better than pushing Samoa Joe but you are basically cutting off your long-term growth by doing that and it's one thing if you're WWE and you have the nostalgia and you have this institutional record of like oh we we know that we had fan we have fans that watched WWE 20 years ago that aren't watching now so it's kind of conceivable that you could convince some of them to tune in for like a nostalgia thing it's much more difficult if you're a TNA or AEW where you're trying to convince people who are really maybe un completely unfamiliar with the fact that you even exist to get those people to tune in right and that kind of puts them in a different sphere than just WWE is in terms of not having the kind of institutional um nostalgia built into the fan base and like even like you can point back to like um even like you know cm punk coming back to wrestling and showing up in aew um you know great television rating when he first debuted huge pay-per-view numbers for his first match but after that kind of you know the novelty of seeing him perform again wore off his drawing power became really limited because i think a lot of the people that were like interested in seeing cm punk to return to wrestling they checked it out they maybe bought what they they tuned into that rampage they they maybe even bought the first pay-per-view match but they didn't stick around because aw isn't the wrestling that they remember from whenever the last time they watched wrestling was or they're not the wrestling that they're familiar with because they were never aw fans before tuning in for that cm punk thing and it's like kind of a fool's errand to, unless you can really convince those fans to stick around, which you're probably not going to be able to do because your product, unless your product is like a mirror copy of what like 2013 WWE was, which I don't think you would want to do. Um, you're not going to be able to kind of keep those fans around forever. Like if you're TNA, you're never going to be able to keep around those like WCW fans from the 90s that are tuning in to see a big sting match. And that's like one of the lessons of that company. And like you mentioned, WWE, like even when WWE do like one of the big Raw shows that have like DX and uh, Triple H and Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker on them, like those shows will usually pop a rating. But as you mentioned, those people don't come back the next week. They're showing up to watch The Undertaker again because they're 45 years old and they liked The Undertaker when they were a kid. Like that's what you're getting out of that. You are not getting anything else out of that. It's not gonna. They're not gonna sit there and be like, oh, "I love this Becky Lynch person. I'm watching every week now." Or like, if they do, that is the vast minority of people. Yeah, there's a very that. very small percentage of people that that's gonna influence. So it, it it is one of my least favorite talking points to be like, "Oh, you gotta look for the casual fan. You gotta look to the past." It's like, no, like you gotta look to the future. You gotta be like, "What can we do to create new fans in 2024?" Because those are the fans who will support you to the death. Like those are the fans that will believe in you to the very end, as opposed to trying to get at best the fleeting attention of somebody who doesn't even like wrestling anymore. I will say these are odd points for us to be making at the end of a podcast where we're just doing nothing but praising a 45 year old wrestler that's been on TV for 25 years. <laughs> the, 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 the moral I think we've come to is Samoa Joe should lose the world title immediately. <laughs> Yeah, should never be pushed again. Um, Tony Khan is a hack and a fraud. How dare he push Samoa Joe? Well, and I think a lot of it comes down to like expectations, which is like, I don't think the expectation with Samoa Joe, this expectation for Samoa Joe, they're looking at Samoa Joe right now. He's being pushed in AEW for what he can do now as a performer, what he brings to the table as a promo, what he brings to the table as an in ring worker. He's not being presented as like the, oh, let's hope some people tune in because they might remember Samoa Joe from Pat, his time on WWE television. Um, he's he's put in the position because of the level he's still at, not because of any appeal that he once had. And that kind of puts that kind of goes back to my point I was kind of making about Kurt Angle back in 2006, which is like Kurt Angle was still super valuable to TNA because he was still performing at a super high level. And was still viewed. He, he's, he wasn't a nostalgia act when he brought him in. When TNA brought in Hulk Hogan, or Ric Flair, 
that was a nostalgia act. Even when they brought in someone like Rob Van Dam, that was a nostalgia act. And I see Samoa Joe is much more similar to someone like Kurt Angle being brought in 2006 than 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 like this nostalgia act, which I think is the key difference. And we we don't like to use the phrase transitional champion because as as you mentioned earlier, it kind of as a, a, like it's a backhanded compliment. It's a bit of a slight almost to call somebody a transitional champion. But like Samoa Joe is going to be the perfect transitional champion. Like if the match at uh, Dynasty is him versus Swerve, he should lose, and then and it's a perfect world title reign. Like he won the belt at a time when AEW's reputation was a little bit shaky for for creative choices. Like they they righted the ship. The Samoa Joe is the perfect guy to do that with to bring it back to pro wrestling basics, and he will lose to the hottest act in the company. That is like as good as you could ask for for a Samoa Joe world title run in 2024. And like if they just pull the trigger on that come uh, Dynasty and he just loses the Swerve, it is like the most the biggest hardiest thumbs up you can give to what the, you could do with a world title run for Samoa Joe in 2024. Mm-hmm. I kind of want I want to see him hold it till. I have no problem with Swerve beating Joe for the title, but I want to see him make it to at least double or nothing. Yeah, he shouldn't. Uh, they should hold the match to double or nothing then. Like, he shouldn't beat Swerve. But whenever you do that match, Swerve should just win. Yeah, and it seems the match, I don't think that match is official yet um, for Dynasty. And we still got a month to go. So it's possible. This, you know, something's happening with Hagman Page too. Like, he's doing a storyline suspension. So it wouldn't surprise me if something else. Maybe Page costs Swerve a, a number one contenders match or something like that, um, but he, but even when he loses that title, he's still going to be a valuable piece going forward. Like it's not like he's going to lose his heat because he loses the title, which kind of goes back to the original point about Samoa Joe as being like this super durable pers- persona that can take losses and still keep going. If anything, this has added like five more years of credibility onto his. Um, run because he's he can now say he was a world champion in AEW and a company that doesn't pass around that belt like to like like peppermints like some other companies have done yeah and he's he will be like you can plug him into any scenario now going forward and he'll do whatever angle he is service like uh, hook was floundering until he had that match with Samoa Joe mm-hmm. like floundering hook was, was was at sea after a year of kind of doing nothing seemed like he was regressing a little bit and then he had that match with Samoa Joe and he like he regained so much with that one match against Samoa Joe and you think about how you can do that with so many other people on the roster that makes Samoa Joe like an invaluable asset to you going forward yeah and Samoa Joe won that match it's not even like he put the hook over just being in the ring and being able to go toe to toe with Samoa Joe but like it's not even like he got it it wasn't even toe to toe he got his ass kicked yeah yeah (laughs) he got fucking demolished he he showed absolutely killed but he showed like fighting spirit so like he came across as good and he like eventually got the you know got him over for for us a a t-bone suplex so like it was okay yeah like they they built that entire match with again my favorite thing Samoa Joe just eating hook alive like absolutely massacring that poor boy to get to that like 90 second stretch of the end where hook gets all his moves in nearly wins and then loses perfect match structure yeah. and hook as i said gained so much from that match after a year where he was just kind of like treading water and that's what samoa joe can do for you because that's how good samoa joe is and you mentioned this earlier like his wembley match with cm punk like which was a really really good match like he deserves like an immense amount of credit for getting that match done like across the board many many reasons yeah (laughs) like if you listen if you heard some of the backstage reports and who knows what's true and what's false there but the fact that he got like that kind of match out of cm punk in that kind of situation uh speaks a lot to not just his ability as a wrestler but his professionalism and his ability to 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 get to work with difficult people backstage yeah, it does seem like the the broad story of that is that like he basically pulled everybody apart, said, we're getting out there now doing the match, all right? And did it. And yeah, then he, had like a four and a half star match in Wembley. Yeah. He maybe like threatens you punk that they're gonna have this match. Because if you're Joe, you're like, this is a huge opportunity for you. It's the biggest so, crowd he's ever worked in front of. Yeah. And you're wrestling, you're supposed to have this big it's the opening match, like you're supposed to have this big, you know, pay-per-view date, you know opener with a major star and it's like this guy's having a meltdown backstage like there is this story um i forget who it was it was some like british rapper who was like backstage at aw and he basically it was dj who kid i believe oh. i don't think he's british though oh yeah well, okay um 
But DJ Who Kid was giving like a recap of what happened. And I think he said like he used the term like everyone was fighting. And then this big Samoan dude or this big Hawaiian yeah. looking dude came out and started yelling at everyone. It's like, I wonder. Who I that love that. Be. Yeah. Like he doesn't he know, even know who Joe, Joe was. Yeah. It's just like this big dude showed up and broke everything up. Started yelling at everyone. And then everyone like calmed down. Um, Just, you know, it just in, in those kind of stories, they just add to the, the aura and the allure of Samoa Joe, you know. Helps helps him feel more real. Yeah, because he, he is watch- he's the he is the most real pro wrestler. Like I really do believe that. Like every time you watch him, everything about his physicality feels real. Everything about his promos feels real. Everything about his presence feels real. And that's the reason you can do anything you want with him, and even bad stuff, and he'll still be a star because he feels real. That's why you connect with him. He doesn't feel phony. It's not the Seth Rollins thing where it's like that is a lame man doing an act. That's that's all you see when you see Seth Rollins. It's like it's cringe, it's embarrassing. Uh, I'll say this here it's a Jeep on a podcast instead of on Twitter where WWE stands can get mad at me. But like it is totally phony. Like that's all Seth Rollins is. It's fake. You see Seth Rollins and like that is fake. And as opposed to that, you see Samoa Joe and you're like, that's real. That's a real man. I believe everything he's saying. Yeah. If you met Samoa Joe like on the street, like he would you would think he'd be extremely similar to how he's been presented as a wrestler for the last 25 years yeah yeah i I would say like moxley is similar in that kind of vein of like he feels like a real person i think that is ultimately like a huge distinction between aew and wwe when i talk to non-fans or people that are very limited in wrestling knowledge when i they talk about like Usually the when I if they find out I like wrestling, they'll be like, of course, oh like WWE. I'm like, yeah, I don't really like WWE. I kind of like watching other wrestling. And I that inevitably leads to like, well, what's the difference? And I think the easiest way for me to summarize the difference between WWE and AEW or or, or any other wrestling company is like with the exception of some people like MJF, like <laughs> AEW like is presented like the characters feel like they're more modern and realistic. They're still characters, but they feel like more like real personalities as opposed to WWE's personalities feel a lot more over the top and cartoonish. And at the end of the day, a lot of people really like the over the top cartoonish characters. Like the Seth Rollins character works for the WWE audience because they don't, I don't think they're really seeing like, oh, he's a phony. They like the color and the pop and the ridiculousness of it all. Um, while AEW at its best in most distinctive difference is like people like Samoa Joe or John Moxley or Brian Danielson or Eddie Kingston, um, where they feel like real people and not like cartoonish personalities. And that's kind of more appealing to like a more serious wrestling fan. Yeah, like WWE is larger than life and AEW is like grounded and human. Mm-hmm. And like there there is pros and cons to both of those things. Like like people like the larger than life stuff. People like the 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 opulence of it all and the the extravagance of it all. And then there's people who like the more grounded human relatable stuff. And that's fine. You don't have to make one into the other. Like you don't have to make WWE and AEW. You don't have to increase, introduce the humanity because the people that watch WWE like the larger in life stuff, as you said, but stop trying to make AEW into WWE then as well. Stop trying to be like, oh, it should be grandeur and spectacle all the time. It's like, no, it should be human and personal. Yeah, I mean, I would always describe it as like, I feel like the AEW product is a lot more modern. Like, it's a lot more similar to, I think, like modern media than like WWE is because of, you know, Vince's influences and kind of the original rise in the 80s. Like, WWE's characters are kind of stuck like characters in 80s movies or like 80s action movies, which are like ridiculous and over the top, as opposed to AW's characters are more better suited, I think, to like popular movies now, which are less bombastic in a lot of ways. Yeah, Samoa Joe, good wrestler. Absolutely. Uh, Garrett, thanks so much for being on the show. Do you have anything you want to plug? Any any of your work you've done recently? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Garrett Kidney if you'd like to hear my thoughts more often. Uh, I, I'm the host of a TNA history podcast right here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. So you, You've Got to Be Kidding Me covers TNA one month at a time. We're currently on March 2000. 
2006. So we're right into the swing of Samoa Joe. He just lost the X Division title to Christopher Daniels in Ultimate X. So we are right in the swing of Samoa Joe's good run in TNA. So it's, it's probably a good time to jump into. You've got to be kidding me if you'd like to hear us talk about Samoa Joe. So that's uh, on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Just search for You've Got to Be Getting Money on your podcast app of choice. And uh, my podcast co-host Liam always gives out to me if I don't plug his Twitter on podcast appearances, I do. So you can follow him at the Gleet Mood on Twitter. <laughs> so I am thinking about this when I was like, uh, the name so the name of your pod is You've Got to Be Kidding Me, which is of course in reference to Don West and one of his signature calls. But it sounds really unfamiliar to me when you say it like professionally, like, oh, the name of our podcast is You've Got to Be Kidding Me. Like the the name of the podcast should be You've Got to Be Kidding Me. Like you gotta yeah. say it in like the exaggerated Don West voice. Otherwise it doesn't make any sense to me. You've got to go full D dub. Yeah. I'm, you know, I really, uh, just random point on Don West. I'm, I was really happy, like, um, obviously his death was really tragic, but it, I was really happy to see so much praise just across the board for his work because I always felt like he was super underrated for somebody that came into wrestling the way that he came into it. Um, and him and Tanae are, to me, like, as iconic of a of announced team as as pretty much anyone. Like, I wasn't... You know, I, I, I'm I'm like the same age as you, Garrett. I wasn't watching like Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan um, or even like JR and King. Like the, to me, those guys aren't that iconic. Like, but like Mike Tanay and Don West calling a wrestling show is 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 iconic to me. And I was obviously, like I said, his death was tragic, but I was really like really satisfied and happy with all of the wonderful praise that he got um, after he passed away for his work. Yeah, I'm really glad like the, the broader historical record has been corrected. Uh, right, like, exactly. It, That's exactly right. Like I'm happy that like when people think of Don West now, it seems like people think of him as like a really good color guy that added a lot to the show he was on. Because if you go back to his reputation at the time, people are like, he sucked, he's terrible. And it's like, you're so wrong. You've never been more wrong. How could you be this wrong about something? But I think it's it's a classic, you don't know what you have until you don't have it anymore. And when it when, like they replaced him with Taz, you're like, oh no. Mike Tanay and Don West were so much better than this. Oh, they replaced no. him. They replaced him with Taz, who like I love Taz. I love him on AEW, but Taz was totally mailing it in, like pretty early in his TNA run. Yeah, and I think and, Taz is better as like a three man desk where there are other people who can bring the enthusiasm. Like Taz is good for like jokes and good like actual like color analysis. But Taz isn't like a guy who brings like super energy to the table. And Mike Tanay is a guy who matched the energy that he was with. So it just kind of brought the mood down. Yeah. And then they did the whole like Taz is an ace is an eights thing, which like mm. I never I, I I like the heel announcers, but I don't like it when the heels are like aligned with a specific group. And like so they're always like objectively cheering for um, certain groups, especially when that group is all over the program like aces and eights was. So it's like, oh, Taz is calling this, you know, Doc Gallows match, and he's got to be like totally in the bag for Doc Gallows. And I was like, this sucks. Yeah. All right, Garrett. Well, thank you so much for doing the show. Uh, I want to thank everyone who's been listening to it, uh, and I'll talk to you again after a while. Thanks. Cheering at pro wrestling shows in Japan is back, and 2023 is already shaping up to be a big year in the history of pro res. That's why you should listen to the Emerald Flow Show. From the Royal Road to the Green Mat, Paul and Gerard take you into the world of All Japan Pro Wrestling and Pro Wrestling Noah. Not only do we analyze events, but we examine business, who is getting over, what angles are working, or not. Occasionally, we take a look at other Japanese promotions like DDT and Zero One. So if you're looking for more coverage of the world of Japanese wrestling, check out the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network available on all of your favorite podcast apps.